Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, we are continuing with our study on cautionary parables where we take a lesson from real life and we start off by, by talking through that and then we, we see what lessons we can learn by finding a biblical parallel or a story in the Bible or a passage in the Bible that, uh, you know, that allows us to look into this into more detail, see what principles we can learn, see what lessons we can learn see how we, we can become better people, but also how we can, more importantly, how we can become better Christians. So we've bounced around a lot in the last couple of weeks. We've been in Germany twice. Uh, we've been in the US. Um, we've been, yeah, we've been, we've been around a little bit. Um, and we're going back to Germany today. Um, we are going to be setting ourselves up across two world wars. Um, and we will be looking at a few interesting um, military tactics. We'll be looking at a one person who kind of holds this whole thing together. Uh, before we start, if you'd just like to join me in a word of prayer. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can get together this evening to learn more about your word, Father, and also to learn lessons from the people in the world that you've created for us, Father. We just pray, pray that we may take these lessons to heart and to mind, Father, that we may become better servants in your kingdom as a result. In your son's mighty name, we pray. Amen. Okay, so we are, we are going to be looking at something you'll probably know quite well. If you know um, your military history at all, you would definitely have heard of this. Um, if you listened in a history class at school, you've definitely heard of this. Um, and I would argue that even if you haven't listened properly in history at school or take any interest in history, you would certainly have heard of a couple of the things that we're going to talk about, that we're going to talk about tonight. So we are going to be in, we're going to be in Germany. We're going to be setting ourselves up in World War II. Now, World War II was particularly brutal. Um, depending on the figures and depending on the people that you, that you speak to, um, anywhere between 70 million and 85 million people, soldiers and non-soldiers, died in the war. The war ended on the 2nd of September, 1945, um, so, and it started six years earlier on the 1st of September, uh, 1939. And in those six years, about 3% of the world's population died. I mean, that is a, an absolutely insane, insane figure. About 3% of the world's population dying in a six-year period. Um, in the end, it was the Brit British-led allies that won the war. They defeated the uh, German-led Axis powers, um, and it was, it was a particularly brutal war. And it was, it was as, as brutal as it was, largely because the Germans managed to gain an advantage very early, and they used a tactic very early that made a massive difference in the great scheme of things. Um, so within six weeks of, with, of the war starting in 1939, the Germans had managed to occupy Belgium, the Netherlands, and France. Soldiers had been decimated. Tens of thousands were dead. Towns had been ravaged. Areas had been destroyed. The Allied forces were in big trouble. Adolf Hitler was in command. Um, he was in charge and he was making massive strides in, 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 the German, in the German warfare. The British-led allies, or the British and American-led allies, were truly, truly on the back foot. They were in big, big trouble. You see, the reason that the Germans were able to get the advantage that they got was because of a military tactic that they used. Now, the Allied forces won the war, but it could have been completely different. And we'll talk a little bit, a little bit later around how and why it could have been extremely, extremely different. Um, Hitler and the rise of Nazism in Germany were on the verge potentially of winning a war due to a military tactic. In those first six weeks where they managed to take control of three countries, they literally three countries in six weeks, it was a devastating loss or the Allied forces. They used a tactic and they used a tool. And you would have heard of both. The military tactic, tactic was known as Blitzkrieg, lightning. And the biggest weapon was 
the tank. This was a massive, massive, massive uh, part of the early um, part of the early fighting and the early part of um, early part of that uh, of the war. So the Blitzkrieg was basically to, to keep it as, as kind of simple as we possibly can. It was a method of offensive warfare using a swift strike. So the idea was to be as fast as you possibly could. Um, the idea was to aim for the enemy's headquarters, to aim for the enemy's um, brain, if you, want to, if you want to call it that. So while soldiers were certainly targeted, the idea was to go for something deeper, to aim for headquarters, etc. cetera. Um, the idea was to use tanks and air support to wipe out as much as you possibly could so that you could win as quickly as you could. And because of this Blitzkrieg tactic, the Germans were in control of all of the early fighting. They were truly, truly dominant. The Allied forces had to retreat in many, exam in many cases. The Allied forces needed to regroup. Uh, new strategies had to be formed. And the, because the old ways of war, which is largely um, artillery-led, which is largely cavalry-led, which is very much um, an idea of, of forces, boots on the ground, weapons in the hands of the boots that are on the ground. But these had been completely overtaken by this new German military tactic, the use of tanks, the use of Blitzkrieg. Now you've probably heard of Blitzkrieg. You've probably heard of a tank. You've probably heard of this military assault that the Germans, um, that the Germans laid on in the early part of World War II. What you probably didn't know was that the Blitzkrieg was not a German idea. In fact, the Blitzkrieg was a British idea. It was created about 20 years before the Germans used it. The British just completely forgot about it. So tonight we are going to be looking at this dude. His name is J.F.C. Fuller. Um, he was a absolute military genius. He was born in September 1878. He died aged 87 in February 1996. And he was a tactician, military tactician, seldom seen at the time before, or you would argue perhaps even seen after. He was exceptionally good at what he did. He was British born, he died in Britain, and he was a military general. He was part of the British army. He was involved in a leadership position in World War I. So, to see what happened in World War II, we need to go back to World War I. World War I, if you know anything about the war, was, was characterized by, uh, largely by, by, trench, by, by trench warfare. Um, trenches were dug, um, barbed wire was laid out, um, and it was incredibly difficult for the forces to even move more than a couple of meters at a time. Through, at one stage, about 800 kilometers of Europe, starting in France and ending in Belgium, ditches had been dug in the soil. Soldiers were effectively stuck. Barbed wire and machine guns had been placed everywhere. Very few people could move. The cavalry, which at the time was largely on horses, couldn't go anywhere. Even the use of, um, even the use of, of toxic gases um, didn't really help anything. It was just a complete murderous stalemate. Tens of thousands of people died in those trenches. Um, a lot of people died of gangrene. There was a disease called trench foot, which just came from having your shoes and, so shoes and socks completely soaked for months upon end. It was a really, really horrific, horrific war. But JFC Fuller was sitting at a picnic in August 1916. And while he was at this picnic, a military picnic, there were other soldiers and, and other um, military generals there. He hears this metallic rumbling in the, in the distance. He was a prolific writer, so he, he wrote out all of, this, um, all of this experience. And 28 tons of cannon and armor plating carried by massive metallic tacks, tracks rolled past. It was the first British Army demonstration of a tank. Fuller was 37 years old at the time, and he saw that the machine was a key instrument in the war. It could cross mud, it could cross trenches, it could squash barbed wire. It could not be shot, 
by the easily shot by the uh, weapons that were available at the time it was the solution to the war the tank would win the war for the british he, he said as much he pushed hard for the british army to involve itself in the use of tank warfare he was added to the newly formed tank corps he was given a blank sheet of paper and told up to come up told to come up with the plan on how the tanks would be used he did his plan was simple it was effective the tanks would attack the German HQs behind enemy lines. There would not be a necessary focus on taking out the soldiers in the trenches because they were already pinned down and ineffective. So using, uh, bomb, uh, using bombs from the air, using air support and machine guns attached to uh, planes, that they would provide cover for the tanks that moved along. The tanks would drive up to these mini headquarters, these mini uh, barracks that had been set up by the Germans and they would um, attack the, the brains of the operation because he argued that without the brains, the body becomes practically, uh, becomes practically useless. He created what was known as Project 1919 or Plan 1919, and he described it as the winning of the war in a single battle. But the thing is, the war ended before 1919. The war ended in 1918. So his, his plan wasn't used, except it was used 20 years later by the Germans. So this is how the story goes. And this is, again, recorded history, so there's no, no doubt about it. Um, in, 19, in 1933, Hitler had come to power. He had become the Fuhrer of, of Germany. Um, he'd started rebuilding his army. And for him, tanks were at the core of it. So for six years, he started building this massive army. In 1939, on his 50th birthday, Hitler paraded his new me mechanized army through the streets of Berlin. There was an Englishman among the crowd. His name was J.F.C. Fuller. The man who had developed tank warfare for the British was now developing tank warfare for the Germans. Now, Fuller was a extremely, extremely weird character. Um, Hitler turned to him during this parade and said, I hope you were pleased with your children. That is how involved Fuller was in the developing of these tanks and the developing of this tank warfare. Now, Fuller was a very, very strange character. He, um, he was involved in the occult. He um, very obviously had, had racist Nazi views, um, particularly regarding, regarding the Jews. And, and we know how under Hitler-controlled Germany, Jews were treated. Um, he, he was a very, very horrible human being, and despite that, a really, really good military tactician. In 1917, Fuller had been planning the defeat of the German army, and 22 years later, he was chilling with Hitler, looking at how the same plan that he had invented for the British 20 years earlier was going to be used to kill thousands, tens of thousands, of British-controlled troops. 13 months after that parade for Hitler's birthday, um, the tanks rolled through Belgium, Holland, and France. In just 46 days, Germany had defeated all three of those nations. The Blitzkrieg had worked just as Fuller said it would. It just worked for the other team. Clearly, forgetfulness can be costly. And that is what we're going to spend time with this evening. We're going to be having a look at the idea of having a good idea and just forgetting about it or having everything at your disposal to make the right decisions and then just forgetting about it. We're going to talk about a little bit about willful ignorance and we're going to be talking a little bit about just forgetting. And I think we all have this, uh, this forgetfulness part of our side, this idea that we, that we just, we just forget, you know, we just, can't remember why we went into a room. We can't remember why we opened the fridge. We can't remember, you know, to pick up something. I mean, how many times have you gone to the shop without a shopping list and come back with everything except the very thing that you went to get in the first place? We have this, we have this forgetfulness um, within us. But there are times when our forgetfulness can be really, really costly. Before we get into our biblical, par uh, biblical parable, our um, cautionary parable, uh, from the Old Testament this evening. Would anyone like to, um, would anyone like to add anything, um, ask a question, 
uh, make a comment uh, about about anything that is um, that has come up at at this stage. It is all yours if you would uh, if you would like to. I've got an eye on the chat and I've got an eye on the um, on on anyone wanting to wanting to talk. Just doing a quick look. All right, so that is that is where we're at. We're in Germany. We've had a look at where we are now. I would like you to have a look, if you would, if you have your Bibles with me. I really hope you do this evening, um, because we're going to be doing quite a lot of of bouncing around. We're going to be in Deuteronomy. We're going to be looking at verses in uh, chapter four. We're going to be looking at verses in chapter eight. We're going to be looking at verses in chapter nine as well. So we're going to be moving a little bit around. So normally I would ask someone to to read the passage for me. Um, but that would mean them reading five chapters of Deuteronomy, which I think would be unfair on them and probably unfair on us to all read five chapters of Deuteronomy. So I'll, I'll just pull up the verses um, the verses as, as we go. So just for a little bit of context to what we're looking at in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the second book of the law. Um, we are, the context of this particular passage is um, Moses is speaking to the Israelite nation before they cross over the River Jordan into the Promised Land. Now, you'll remember with, with this whole story is that Moses wasn't allowed in. He um, had had. He was just basically sick and tired of the Israelite people moaning and complaining and demanding stuff and not being happy. And they, so he was really, really upset. So when God said, you know, get water from the rock, instead of doing just that Moses strikes the rock with his uh, with his stick with his cane with his um with his staff and and water starts gushing out so the people get what they want but because of Moses outburst um, God says to him he cannot enter the promised land so instead of feeling sorry for himself Moses says well okay I can't go in but I can certainly leave you guys a message for what happens when you go in. And that is the context of what we're looking at now. Now, I wish, I, I really, really wish that this was one speech. I, I think we're all suckers for a, for a really good speech, for a really good bit of, of public speaking. Um, Luther King's I Have a Dream, um, Nelson Mandela at the Ravonia Treason Trial saying it is an ideal for which I'm, I hope to see, but it is an ideal for which I'm prepared to die. Um, there's Barack Obama's inauguration speech when he became the first ever black president of America. Um, there's Thabo Mbeki's absolutely brilliant I'm an African speech, which is really, really worth just reading. It is a, a brilliant, brilliant piece of writing and, and even brilliant, more brilliantly delivered. We, we love speeches. We love this grand gesture, gesture of someone on stage. It's one of the reasons that, uh, you know, the, the charismatic pastors and charismatic preachers are able to get away with the ridiculous things that they get away with because we love a good speech we love energy we love uh, the 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 charisma that people have so i really really love the idea of moses delivering this as one speech he probably didn't i wish he did i wish it was kind of like brave hearts you can take our country but you can't take our freedom I really wish it was that kind of a speech. I really wish it was Uncle Ben's with great power comes great responsibility in Spider-Man. But the reality is it probably wasn't because Moses's final message to the Israelite people before they cross into the promised land is 30 chapters of Deuteronomy. Now, I have been known to speak a lot, but I have never spoken for 30 Bible chapters, um, or at least I, I hope I haven't. Um, so it's very unlikely that it was one speech, but it's still the stuff that he says in the speech is incredibly powerful. And he repeats a few things um, as, as he goes through. And like I said, I'm just looking from chapters four to chapter nine. There are loads of other times where he says um, similar things, but I just want to have a look at the main thrust of the message that Moses gives to the people of Israel before they go into the promised land. And I think it's really important because as we go into troubled times or as we go into uncertain times, times that we're facing right now, it's, it's very easy to, it's very easy to forget. It's very easy to feel a little bit uneasy, to feel a little bit unsure. And the people of Israel absolutely 
knew that. They were going to something they'd never experienced. They had just done 40 years of wilderness wandering. They had just come out of slavery in Egypt. They'd been chased by Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's army. They, they had gone through these difficult periods. That, it was a really, really difficult time for them. And now they were crossing into this land that they'd been promised, but they didn't know what to expect. They knew there would be rival tribes. Would those rival tribes accept them or would they fight them? Would they, um, what, what would happen? Where would they live? Where would they stay? Would they continue to be nomadic or would they be allowed to establish major cities? There was all of this kind of stuff going on and this uncertainty going on. And, and we're living in an uncertain time too. We're living in a time where we're not quite sure what's going to happen next. Uh, just today, it was announced that the national state of disaster has been extended by another month, which means that our lockdown will continue until at least November 15th, maybe even beyond that, um, at level one or perhaps a reduced level one. We don't know yet. Um, President Ramaphosa is speaking to, the, speaking to uh, Parliament tomorrow about South Africa's economic recovery plan. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on where, where there's answers and there's not answers. And it's just a, a period of uncertainty. And the message that I want to want to go through tonight, the, the lesson that we learned from JFC Fuller and the British Army's forgetfulness of a brilliant military tactic is a lesson that we can learn because Moses speaks to the people of Israel before they go into the promised land. And he tells them, do not forget. And it is a lesson that we need to take for ourselves. So um, I'm just going to pull up a few verses. Follow me, uh, follow with me if you will. And then um, I'll open up for, for some conversation just once we've looked at a couple of, of these verses. Um, so Moses was not allowed to cross uh, the Jordan into the promised land, but he left the people with a message. And he starts off in, in verse four. He says, hear now, O Israel, the, laws, the Lord's decrees and the Lord's. That's, that's how we start. And he says, um, he says, I'm about to teach you. I'm about to give you all these laws. Hear them. Then he says, follow them in verse one. Then he says, do not add and do not subtract to them. Now, he can say this. He can tell the people that they need to follow these laws because he starts off verse three by saying this. You saw with your own eyes what the Lord did at Baal Peor. The Lord your God destroyed from among you everyone who followed the Baal of Peor and all who held fast to the Lord your God still alive today. He's basically saying to them that you've witnessed this. You've seen the stuff that I'm about to tell you. These are not made up rules from some abstract being who you don't know anything about. He's saying you have seen this. You have witnessed this yourself. And there's an important lesson for us in that that we'll, we'll talk through a little bit later. So think about this in your, own, in your own mind. You've seen this. You've witnessed. You've experienced. That should give you an element of certainty as you go into an uncertain time. So let's go through with the other things that he says. And he says, because of the, everything that they've witnessed, he has a simple message for them. You need to remember to remember. Now, there are a couple of verses that he says, and please follow, um, please follow with me if you will. In verse 9 of Deuteronomy chapter 4, it says, Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, and when you said to me, Assemble the people, before me to hear my words so that they may learn to revere me. He's saying to them in this case, don't forget what you have seen. Remember to remember and teach other people about them because other people might not have been there. So use what you have seen, use what you know to teach. Then he says in uh, Deuteronomy chapter eight, and verse he says remember quite a lot um, in the passages. And again, you, you're more than welcome to to find verses that, that perhaps you find um, uh, more personally uh, impactful. Um, but these are just some that, that, I, that I looked at. Um, verse 10 and verse 11 of Deuteronomy chapter 8 is really, really great. It says, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Verse 11, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to serve his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when the, your herds and flocks 
for a large in your silver and gold increase and all, your, all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. See what he's saying? He's saying in all of life's settings, do not forget what God has done. And because you have not forgotten what God has done, we follow his instructions, we obey his commands, we follow his laws, we obey his decrees, because we remember, we do not forget the Lord your God. We do not forget what he has done for us. So as you're entering periods of uncertainty, it is fundamental that we do not forget, that we remember to remember. Would anyone like to, before we get to, um, before we just to get to a couple of little um, things that I've pointed out, just uh, four or five little um, four or five little bits of uh, quick fire what we learn from from these two stories. Um, I'm going to open up to anyone who would like to um, who would like to make a comment or, or say anything at at this stage. The, the the online room is yours. Is anything from the story that stands out, or is there anything that uh, that that had a had an impact on you when when going through the story. Just looking through, making sure I haven't missed any chats. Um, no, it looks like we all looks like we all clear. Okay, so let's go very quickly to um, very quickly to the things that we learn. Q, um, just four very, very quick fire. What do we learn from, from, these, from these two stories? What do we learn from the story of uh, JFC Fuller and the British Army completely forgetting um, about a great military tactic that they had at their disposal? And what do we learn about uh, from, from the story of Moses entering the Promised Land and the message that he gave um, before the Israelites uh, crossed the River Jordan? So the first thing we learn is that we need to stay focused. It's very easy to lose sight of the bigger picture when things get rough. It's very easy to focus on the narrow. It's very easy to focus on exactly what is in front of you. Now, in many ways, um, in many ways that is a good thing. In many ways, staying focused is a great thing. Um, in many ways, it is, a, it is good not to be distracted by a whole bunch of other things. But when it comes to the uncertainties or those dark periods in our lives, we must focus on the things that God has done for us. The things that he's doing for us now, the things that he's done for us in the past, the things that he, will, he has promised to do and will do for us in the future. We cannot afford to lose focus when things get tough or when times get rough or when we're hit by periods of uncertainty. Had the British Army stayed focused as the Germans started building up their, their army, the British would have realized, oh, hang on, there was this really good thing we had 20 years ago from this really, really, quite frankly, genius strategist. Can't we just, you know, dust that file off and, and make ourselves the strongest possible army uh, in the world? but they weren't focused. They put all of their attention, and I didn't go into full details about the story, but it's absolutely remarkable um, how the British basically threw more horses at the problem. They, when things came tough, and tough during tank warfare, they doubled up their budget on hay and feed for the horses. So while the Germans were building tanks, the British were birthing horses because they'd lost focus on what they had at their disposal. When times got uncertain, they doubled down instead of focusing on what they had. So the first lesson for us is that we cannot lose sight of the bigger picture. We need to be focusing on what God has done for us, has done previously, currently, and has promised to do in the future. So that's the first one. The first thing we need to do is we need to stay focused. The second thing to realize is that there is always strength in numbers. I don't think there has been a single study that we've done over the last six weeks now and where we haven't mentioned that incredibly famous verse of do not, do not forsake the gathering of the saints. When you're battling, when you are unsure of what to do, there is strength in numbers. Fall back on the knowledge and the experience of others. 
we don't need to come up with something new every time we face a challenge. We just need to remember. Um, there are loads of scriptures to, to this effect. There's, there's a passage in, um, I think it's Second Thessalonians. I, I, I didn't take it down. It says, test everything and hold on to what is good. And, and the temptation is to, to physically go out and test everything. But you don't have to. Why not just ask someone else who has tested it? If you are going through a difficult time in your marriage, why not ask someone who's been married for 50 years? What, you know, we don't have to test these difficult waters. We don't need to cross the Jordan on our own. We can fall back on the knowledge and on the experience of others. Moses did not cross the river Jordan into the promised land, but he gave spectacular advice to those who did. And we must, must make sure that we are tapping into the knowledge and the experience that we have. There is strength in numbers. And when Christians stand together, we become an unstoppable, unstoppable force. We, we cannot lose this idea of fellowship. And, and it's been hard, especially in 2020. It's, it's, it's weird feeling part of a congregation, but also not feeling part of a congregation because people are far away and you don't see each other. And it's a very, very weird kind of feeling and a very weird, weird time. But we, we have strength in numbers and we have people within our congregation. And I think when we start gathering together in a couple of weeks, two and a half weeks now, um, we'll see the value of having strength in numbers. Do not forsake the gathering of the saints. It is, it is an absolutely vital, fundamental part um, of, of what we do. The next thing that we need to realize is that we, we, mustn't, we mustn't quit when you're ahead. Um, the British won World War I. They had this amazing tank plan in place, but they won the war. They didn't need the plan. You know, it was plan 1919. The war was over in 1918. We didn't need this plan. They got, they stopped while they were ahead, but they hadn't yet finished. And there are lots of stories to, to this effect that you see, um, that you see through, through history. So I, I looked at, at a couple of them. Um, so the digital camera, the digital photo camera thing that, that we all have, that's now built into our phones. But remember the first digital camera came out, how it completely obliterated the, the film industry. Um, if I remember correctly, about, about two years ago, the last ever um, film manufacturing factory uh, shut down, and that was, that was Kodak. But I don't know if you know this, um, the guy who invented the first ever digital camera worked for Kodak. His bosses didn't see the value in his product. Kodak missed the chance to develop the product that ultimately destroyed their business. And they're not the only case. In 1970, Xerox, you guys know Xerox printers? You know, when you talk about a photocopier, it's just become Xerox. Um, everyone knows that a, a vacuum cleaner is called a Hoover. It's one of those things. So Xerox photocopying machines. Do you guys know that the first ever personal computer was developed by a Xerox employee? And Xerox did nothing with it. Microsoft's Bill Gates and Apple's Steve Jobs, they watched what was going on. And now the rest is history. The two biggest brands in computing are Microsoft and Apple, and Xerox still makes photocopying machines. Sony invented the first ever digital uh, did the first ever digital portable music device. They called it the Sony Digital Walkman. Because Sony owned the Walkman brand. Sony Music had access to some of the biggest names. Celine Dion was part of the, the Sony brand. The, the Walkman was like the big thing. Again, anything that played music on the go was known as the Walkman. Sony had the brand. They were the first ones to develop and produce and sell a digital music player. And then they just stopped and the iPod became for a long time the biggest digital music player in the world but it was not originally Apple's idea and if you continue with looking at the history of the iPod the moment Apple realized that the iPod was falling out of favor they shifted the iPod's product onto their phones so now Apple Music is effectively an Apple iPod but it's on your phone they learned the lesson of not forgetting and not re making the mistakes that other companies had made. And it is a huge, huge lesson to us. Don't quit while you're ahead. Keep on going, stay determined until the end. Philippians 4 verse 13 says, I press onwards 
towards the goal. You know, have you guys seen that very famous photo of Usain Bolt winning the uh, Beijing Olympics um, and breaking the world record? But he's looking to the side at the finish line clock. He won the race so easily. He looked over the clock to see if he had broken his record. There were a lot of analysts that believe that he could have gone a couple of a, a few hundreds of a second faster and been the first man to run under 9.6 for a hundred meters, which is which is absolutely remarkable. But he slowed down towards towards the finish line. We cannot be the same. We must stay determined until the end. We we cannot just stop because we've had a victory or because victory is in sight. We must uh, press on towards the goal. We must keep going. And then the last thing that, that I want to touch on, and then I'll open up if anyone wants to say or add anything or ask any questions. Um, but this is literally the last point for, for the evening is we must remember to remember. Don't give yourself the chance to forget. There's a reason we create shopping lists. There's a reason we write things down in our diary. There's a reason that I set my alarm for 6.50 p.m. this evening to remind me that there was a Bible study starting at 7 because we are prone to forgetting. And if we put reminders in our everyday lives, why do we sometimes seem reluctant to put reminders into our Christian lives? If you're battling to pray, set an alarm on your phone that reminds you to pray. There's, there's no need to feel guilty about needing to be reminded about something. We need to stop ourselves from forgetting. Remember to remember. Throughout Deuteronomy, Moses says to the people of Israel, do not forget. Remember what you have witnessed. You saw these with your own eyes. The Lord did this amazing thing at this place. Don't forget those things. Teach them to your children. Teach them to your children's children. Remember to remember. There's a reason that we have the Lord's table every week, that we don't just take it at, at Christmas and Easter. Because in Luke 20, 22 verse 19, Jesus says, every time you partake of this, do this in remembrance of me. We cannot allow ourselves to forget. We must remember to remember. And that is it. That is uh, the, the, the four points that I wanted to pull from this evening study, from, from, the, lessons, um, from the lessons that we learned. Um, just a very, very quick recap. Remember that we have everything at our disposal. We have our personal experience. We have the experience of others. We have the biblical recordings. We have real life examples waiting for us that when things get tough, when we're going into periods of uncertainty, um, we mustn't forget. And if we remember these things, we can push on towards the goal. So that is everything that I wanted to share this evening. Um, if, you, if anyone would like to, to make a comment or ask a question, um, maybe there was a Bible verse that you, that you came across that I, that I didn't um, mention. Um, if anyone would like to do that, uh, now we are completely open. Um, if, anyone would like to, if anyone would like to say anything. Nope, I'm keeping an eye. Everything looks quiet, I think. Matt? Yes, hi. Um, just with the, the passage in Deuteronomy, um, mm -hmm. quite interesting when, when he tells them, when you get to the land and you eat and you're satisfied, praise the Lord, otherwise you'll forget. And, and when he goes down a bit further, it's like, because if you don't do that, Mm -hmm. You will forget. It's not like 50-50, maybe you will forget. Yeah. It's like if you don't remember to praise the Lord for what you have, you mm -hmm. will forget that it came from him. Yep. That, that's, that's, verse, that's verse 14 of chapter 8. It says, if you don't, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God. Like, yeah, that's really, that's really, really powerful. If we don't, if we aren't actively reminding ourselves at every chance that we get, we run the very, very real risk of forgetting what God has done has done for us. It's very easy to rely on ourselves and forget um, and forget what God has done for us. Would anyone else like to uh, thank? Thanks for that, Heather. Would anyone else like to like to say anything? Like to make a comment? Looking around. No. All right, then I think um, we're going to call it quits for the evening. Thanks again very much for, for jumping in and for, um, and for joining us. I really, really do, uh, I really, really do appreciate it. 
Um, I'm torn about what we're going to do next week. Um, I'm, I'm very tempted to look at um, America de declaring war on, pin on pinball. Um, I might look at um, the most decorated New Zealand military officer who happened to be a woman who could uh, karate chop people to death. Um, or I might look at how um, people's pants exploded in New Zealand for a little while. Um, just because I think we could do with we could do with quite a fun, uh, quite a weird one. We've had a couple of heavy topics over the last um, over the last few weeks, um, so you know I'm toying around with a few ideas, but I really hope that you're going to uh, that you'll join us that you'll join us next week. Uh, Grant, I see you. Your cameras come on and your mic is on. Yeah, come to say uh, thanks, Matthew. Really appreciate your work and all you're doing for us. Uh, really appreciate your lessons. Thanks so much, and uh, good night. Thanks, I'd really appreciate it. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, if you, um, uh, if anyone has any stories or any person that you want me to look at, um, by the nature of my job, I can research things quite quickly and quite effectively. So if you have a, a, a thing that you say, Matt, this would be quite fun, um, or this would be quite interesting, please send it my way. I'm more than happy to, um, I'm more than happy to look, to look into that. Merci, Matt. Yeah, hi, Conrad. How's it, man? Thanks so, thanks so much. You just remind me of the military days, uh, good mm -hmm. or bad, and uh, it makes more sense, I think, if you were in the military, you can realize uh, how important it is to, to think ahead. Mm. Yeah, and also just using the tools that are at your disposal. You know, you can think yeah. ahead because you know what you have, but if you forget what you have, it's incredibly difficult to, to think ahead. So, so, yeah, thank you. Um, all right, if that's it, uh, let's close in a word of prayer and then um, until we meet again, uh, until we meet again next week. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, we once again thank you for the opportunity to get together and to learn more about your word, Father, to learn lessons from, to learn lessons from various people, various events, various scenarios that have existed, Father. And we just pray that we will um, never forget the lessons that we learn, Lord, that we constantly remind ourselves um, to, to be better Christians, Father, to follow your decrees, not out of a blind obligation, Father, but because we have witnessed and we have seen and we have felt the things that you have done in our lives, Father. So we, we just pray that we may continue pushing onward, that we may stay focused, that we uh, learn from the experience of others and know that there is strength in numbers that comes with gathering with your people, Father. We just pray that as we go into the week ahead, that we will remember to remember, Father, focusing on you, and making sure that you are praised at all times. Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to get together under difficult circumstances, and we look forward to when we can meet again in person. Father, we, thank, we pray for all these things in your son's mighty name. Amen. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks. Cheers, guys. Thanks very much. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good evening. Bye. 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 God bless.